All right, guys, we're in week three of Big Fish. And if you've been around Movement Church at all, or you've been around me and Rod at all, uh, you know that we're real big on check your attitude, right? That there's a tell, we tell our kids all the time. There's very few, first of all, hold on, pause. Well, I left and I couldn't see all this good. And Pastor Seth changed all the lights on vacation and now we see you. So you're looking really good this yeah. morning. Yeah, okay. Um, we tell our kids all the time that, you know, there's so many circumstances your entire life long that you have zero control over, right? But God always made you to be the victor instead of the victim. So when you can't change your circumstance, you change your circumstance about the situation, right? Come on. So uh, maybe uh, you got into this Jonah series And had your feelings hurt a little bit that this Bible hero we learned about so much in children's church in Sunday school when we were a kid wasn't so much of a hero at all. He actually just got swallowed by a big fish and that's what made him Jonah, right? Because so far, and I'm not knocking Jonah and this is not a character bashing session, right? But I love it that there's a whole book of the Bible that highlights an imperfect prophet's life, right? That he, he was used by God in many ways, in mighty ways, through the years, but we're getting to see what we really don't see a lot about our faith heroes, that he was also a human with an attitude and he had to work it through for himself, right? So we're gonna jump in. Jonah 3, uh, we're gonna actually do the whole fourth chapter and it's short, so don't panic. When a pastor says, we're gonna read the whole chapter, they're not talking about Psalm 119, hopefully, right? Because that's like the longest chapter in the Bible. So this is a short chapter, but I wanna wanna do Jonah 3.10 first because it segues right in. Now, remember... The word had been delivered. Mary was like eight words long that Jonah said, and Nineveh changed their hearts and changed their behavior and changed their minds, right? So Jonah 3.10, when God saw that they had, what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. That's a great ending for Nineveh, chapter four. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. He complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home, you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn your back from destroying people. (laughs) Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Then the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Jonah went out to the east side of the city. No answer, right? (laughs) Went to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. And soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. And this, this eased his discomfort. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. And the next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. And the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. That is my 21 years of living in Lake County, Florida. That's how hot it was. I loved loved our church, loved our people, but like God, kill me now if this is the rest of my life, right? (laughs) Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. You ever been there? Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? And Jonah said, yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you can feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. That's why I love my God. He loves puppies. Right? Right? Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And guys, the chapter ends and the story ends right there. Here's some facts. We're just going to dive in. You find yourself where you find yourself in this journey, all right? Number one, Jonah made a judgment about God. Jonah 3.10, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and didn't care out the destruction. 4.1 4.1 says, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became angry. Another version of the Bible says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. What God did seemed very wrong. Talk about arrogance, right? Here's a man who literally refused to obey God and what he told him to do. And it was such a strong defiance, he got swallowed by an actual fish. And after that, he decided to sit in a position of power against God who gave the order and made a fish big enough to swallow him. 
I can't wrap my head around it. But you know what? There's a lot of things that I deem questionable that God does, right? Like mosquitoes, (laughs) humidity, childbirth itself. There had to be an easier way for this, right? Temperatures above 85 degrees. I don't get it. Cuckleburrs, you remember those? I don't know what they call them in other parts of the world, but here we call them cuckleburrs, right? Those things that stick to your clothes and your feet when you're barefoot. Snot. Pus. When he tells me to keep my mouth shut, when I know, I know my opinion was meant to change the world. I don't get it when he tells me to be quiet. So, when a case goes to court, the judge or jury doesn't get to render a verdict until all the evidence has been presented, right? You don't get to render a verdict off of just the prosecution or just the defense. Everybody has to be able to settle who carries the burden of proof, and then it's settled, right? See, we don't see everything God sees. We don't know everything he knows, every minuscule detail of why he does what he does. So, therefore, we don't get to render a verdict if he's right or wrong when he sees it all, right? It's kind of like how when you were a kid in the car at night and your mom would say, turn off that overhead light. Your dad can't see to drive. It was my mom, clearly, right? (laughs) Turn that overhead light off. Your mom can't see to drive. Your dad can't see to drive. And you're like, why? Why? What? I don't get it. And now I'm like, turn that light off. I can't see the road, right? You get it now. Or like, turn that radio down. Your dad's going through traffic. You're like, he can see, can he? But now I'm like, Abby, turn that mess off. I get it now, right? See, our part is not understanding. Our part is trust. Our part is obedience. It's not understanding. Y'all okay? Okay, it doesn't get better. Number two, (laughs) Jonah Jonah admits to trying to control and correct God's mistake. Verse two, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home, you would do this, Lord? That is why, that's why I ran away to Tarshish right there. I knew you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. He admits this out loud. You ever had somebody, they say something and you go, you just said that. I said that in a counseling session one, one time. We were meeting with a couple and, and the husband said something and I said, you realize you just said that out loud, right? You, I get that. Like sometimes I'm like, I can't believe I just said that out loud. But listen, when your compass is skewed, you'll head completely in the wrong direction, right? Listen to this. A compass needle works by aligning itself with earth's natural magnetic field. In almost all compasses, the north pointing needle is marked either with paint or by the shape of the needle itself. However, A compass needle is a delicate magnetic instrument, and it is possible for the poles to become reversed if the compass is brought into close contact with another magnet. If this happens, you will need to remagnetize the compass using a strong magnet. Listen, there was a time when Jonah's heart was aligned with the Lord. He was a prophet. He was a messenger. And there was a time that his compass pointed north, and he knew exactly what his assignment was and what God's heart was. I don't know what the group was that he was hanging around. I don't know what it was that made him so angry about Nineveh. But he was listening to somebody, and his compass was getting polarized a completely different way. Are you listening to me? Jonah had let the voices and the opinions around him polarize him and send him in a completely different direction. Listen, be careful who you are aligning yourself with. (sighs) You better watch it. If you're aligning your heart with people who don't, listen to me, if you're aligning your heart with people who what they believe or what they're living is not drawing them into a place of loving people well, you're aligning yourself with the wrong people. I'm not talking about they pretend everything's fine with everybody. Jesus addressed sin. He addressed issues. But if the fruit's on the tree, y'all, you can tell an apple tree because the apples are on the tree, right? So if I'm, if I'm hanging out, I'm aligned in my spiritual life or whatever with, with people who are teaching something that is not drawing people to us, it's wrong. Because everywhere Jesus went, he had a, a following, didn't he? He had a crowd. Listen, the big fish didn't do the job in Jonah. It didn't. He didn't change his attitude. I heard that fish spit him out. Wow, that's good. That's good. It got him where he was supposed to go, but it did not fix his heart. Oh, wow. yeah. James 1.20 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Yeah. Yeah. Preach. 
Romans 2, 4 says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Listen, you can't do what God can do, period, ever. Not on your best day, not on your holiest day, where you live by every commandment and every bit of the finished work of Jesus, you still can't do what God can do in the human heart. Your wrath will never accomplish his purpose. I've tried. It doesn't work. Number three, Jonah decided his agenda was greater than his purpose. This hurt my feelings. Jonah 4.3, he said, Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Listen, all because God is a compassionate God. You talk about being misaligned, right? History is littered with people who shaped the world only by doing what they were called to do, even if it cost them their comfort to do it, right? There's a seesaw in your heart all the time. Do I care more about my agenda or my purpose? My agenda or my purpose? And the more we walk with Jesus, our agenda and our purpose should look alike, right? But for a long time, my agenda and my purpose are at war with each other. You remember doing a seesaw when you were a kid? And if you were a little on the chunkier side, you were always the one that just went to the bottom real fast, right? And then there was a kid somewhere on your playground that sat with you and you were equally balanced. And you were like, I am suspended off the earth. Like, this is the coolest thing in my whole life. I am, I am literally levitating above the ground, right? This is science. We don't need to go back to class. It's happening right here, right? But you know what? Sometimes you need to realize that your purpose needs to knock you off that seesaw for a little bit. When the big kid got on it and you flew off when you got up to the air. Let me tell you something. What does it matter if I believe this or I believe that about politics or theology or whatever it is if I lose my family in the process, right? What does it matter how much insight I have if it polarizes me from the coworkers I spend eight hours of my day with all the time, Right? Listen to me. If you have to choose between agenda and purpose, choose purpose. Because the more you live your purpose, the more you're walking with Jesus and following your purpose, your agenda is going to take care of itself. You're going to realize, I don't really have an agenda. My agenda is whatever he wants, right? Hey, this is what Jesus did, John 6, 38. He said, for I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. You ever stopped and thought for a minute that he had his own will? What? That'll shake you up a little bit. That Jesus had his own will. He said, I'm saying it again. I've come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. So as he's walking through the earth, he's receiving real-time information from Father, right? Saying, Jesus, now I need you to go over here and handle this. And he's like, but I really wanted to go over there and eat that fish, right? Matthew 26 Um, 37 through 39, it says, he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. And he said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass for me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I can tell you right now that if Jesus had his own will, it was good, right? But even there, He submitted to the Father's will, which is always the highest will. That's humbling. When I think I've got it all figured out, I know. I've got my ministry license. I've been theology school. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You don't know if that's what you're saying. You don't know, right? Because Jesus is the no. He is the K-N-O-W. He is all knowledge. And if he bowed his will to the Father, we need to be bowing our will to the Father, right? Number four, y'all Okay. It doesn't get better. All right, number four. Jonah won't answer God's question and has a temper tantrum. This might be my favorite part. All right, Jonah four. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Jonah went to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen in the city. Didn't answer the question. You ever had that kid? Like, what what is that bad look on your face for? And they're like, ooh, ooh. The average four-year-old child asks two to 300 questions a day. Some of our kids are overachievers, right? Some of our kids, I know, Nick, I know. 
It's more like five to 600 probably, you know? That, and listen to this. Kids ask an average of 40,000 questions. Again, that's average. That always means there's above average too, right? 40,000 questions between ages two and five. There aren't, and people say, well, there's no dumb questions. Yes, the, well, let me tell you something. The lie detector has determined that that is false. <laughs> there are dumb questions, right? And if you're a parent, you spend three quarters of your parenthood answering dumb questions. No offense to children in here. I was a child too. We're all children. You never outgrow your need for Father God. We ask dumb questions too, don't we? Can I offer you some advice? I'm going to offer it anyway, okay? Do what you want to do with it. When God asks you a question, answer it. He already knows the answer. He's not asking because he needs your profound wisdom or your theology, right? He knows the answer. He's trying to show you the answer. Here's some examples of that. In Genesis 3, the man and wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking. Think That just gives me chills to think about. They're sitting there and they hear him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? Do you think he really didn't know where they were? Come on, right? And then he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? He knew, didn't he? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? It's like when you ask your kid, did you eat that brownie before dinner? And the brownie's all over the face. And they said, no, Abby did it, right? <laughs> right. And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Don't even get me started on this. All right. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? Do you think God didn't know the answers to all of these questions? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. All right, here's in John 5. One of the men laying there had been sick 38 years and Jesus saw him, saw he'd been ill a long time and said, would you like to get well? Do you think Jesus didn't know the answer to that? Right, he knew. He needed him to say, yes, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it, right? Here's another one, Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the son of man is? Well, they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say I am? He knew what his opinion was among them. He lived with them all day, every day for three years, right? So listen, when God asks questions, they're designed to draw you to truth. That's what they're for. He's not asking you because he needs your answer. You need the answer. So he's asking you, there's a situation in my own life right now where I'm angry about something. I've been angry about it for a while. My husband's had to hear it a lot. It's not about him, but I'm angry about something in my life. And as I was preparing this, Holy Spirit said, is it right for you to be angry about this? The same question that he asked Jonah. And I paused and I said, you know what, Lord? It is. It is right for me to be angry about this. And he said, this is what he said to me. You're exactly right, it is but now you be angry and sin not about it. I said, well, now I don't know what to do at all, right? <laughs> Could you be any clearer, Lord? Okay. Anger becomes a problem though, only when. Now, remember, Jesus was angry. We saw his anger a few times through the gospel. Anger is not a bad thing. It was designed to cause change, right? Right? but it becomes a problem when we sin and we hurt others with it, right? Or we are being held hostage by it. So as long as I can check those boxes, that anger is not something I'm supposed to sit and live with. I'm supposed to do something about it. So now I'm in a position about this of, Lord, what do you want me to do about it? And I don't know yet, but I know he made it very clear I'm not supposed to handle it the way I've been handling it, yeah. right? Not so loud, right? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number five, <clears throat> God brought the shade. Everybody say, he brought the shade. Brought the shade. Jonah 4.6, and the Lord arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun, and it eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But listen, Jonah was still in a place where he didn't understand that God had the same mission toward his own heart as he had toward Nineveh. I'm going to say it again. Yeah. <laughs> Jonah was still in a place where he didn't understand that God had the same mission toward his own heart as he had toward Nineveh. Wow. Wow. 
after the temper fits and the rage and the hardheadedness and the rebellion and the anger and the stubbornness, God provided a shade. That's who he is. Again, because Romans 2, 4 says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Listen, God always intended for you to repent in the shade rather than in the turn or burn. I'm going to say that one more time too. He always intended for you to turn in the shade, not in the turn or burn. I don't want to manipulate my kids into doing the right thing. There's a period of time where you have to do that with kids, right? You know that right here. You know what I'm talking about? Follow me for some tips, but here's one. Like, <laughs> just a little pressure. And if you talk real soft, when we get to the car, this is not ending well for you. Oh. Almost a little mafia sound, you know what I'm talking about, in your voice? I don't care if it's Walker Wyndham or Stronger, if they exist, I don't know. They will go, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, 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 okay, okay. One, side note, one time I pinched Abby, she was little in a store, and I had said, I'm just going to give you a signal. And if you're misbehaving in the store, I'm going to give you a signal. And it's going to be, I'm going to pinch your leg. And when I get to the car, I'm going to tear your tail up. You understand me? She's like, yes, ma'am. All right. So we get in the store and she asked, she would say, I want that, 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 I want that. Like, would she? Like, like she was stuck. I want that, 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 I want that. And I was like, stop saying that. You're not getting it. And so she just arched her back and had a little hissy fit about three years old in the middle of the cart in Walmart. And I just pinched her little leg, looked at her and she's like, oh, man. And I, I grabbed it pretty hard. And she goes, oh, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Be healed. And I got down in her face. I said, don't you bring him into this. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Don't you pray for healing right now. No, ma'am. I taught her right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, in the name of Jesus. She was so cute. And then we got to the register and she said, the lady behind us said, how are you today, pretty girl? She always had this big, huge hair on top of her head with a bow, this big, you know. And she said, how are you, pretty girl? She said, oh, I'm fine, but my mom pinched my leg. And that means I'm going to get spanking when I get to the car. <laughs> I was like, well, going to jail. Florida is not a spanking friendly state. So yeah, all right. But you know what? There's a period of time where you've got to do that. But the, but the more they're walking and they understand the core values of this family, the integrity that we're going to represent everywhere we go, the God that we serve, and this is why we do this, they shouldn't have to be manipulated at 16, 17, 25, 30, right? You see what I'm saying? God always intended for you to repent in the shade. Listen to this. A grandfather found his grandson jumping up and down his playpen, crying at the top of his voice. But when the little one saw his grandfather, he reached up his chubby hands and said, take me out, grandpa. It was only natural for the grandpa to bend down and pick the little fellow up. But the mother stepped in and said, no, sir, you're in trouble and you're staying in there. The grandfather was at a loss of what to do. The child's tears and chubby hands reached deep into his heart, but the mother's firmness was not to be taken lightly. Amen? Here was the problem of love versus law, but love found a way. The grandfather couldn't take the youngster out of the playpen, so he crawled into it with him. There's no tantrum that you'll ever throw, no mess you'll ever make, that God is not willing to crawl in there with you and sit there with you until he can change your heart, right? Yes, yes, yes. Number six, this is the last one. She wishes she had babies so she could try it. She, we would find her tipped over. You ever seen that video of the grandma that tries to get in the crib and she flips over into the crib? That would be what she did, yeah. All right, last one, here we go. God will use whatever he needs to in order to reveal your heart. God arranged for the worm. The next day at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant, so it withered away and the sun grew hot and God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. And the sun beat down his head till he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he said. And God said, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, even angry enough to die, said Jonah. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, but you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry? for such a great city. We hate inconveniences, right? Our wi is a little slow. I'm as mad as Jonah. About August, when the pumpkins start coming out and it's still 110 degrees in North Alabama, I get as angry as Jonah. Someone has a loud opinion on social media about something I strongly believe against or for or whatever, I get as mad as Jonah. An event gets canceled that I've invested time or money or effort in, I get as mad as Jonah, right? 
Someone's rude or takes advantage of me, I get as mad as Jonah. One September, our air went out upstairs. We have two units, and I was as mad as Jonah for days. Go ahead. Days. A politician says something stupid, I get as mad as Jonah. Do you see what I'm saying? But you know what? Traffic, I get as mad as Jonah. (laughs) But you know what? Here's the truth. None of those things have the power to make me angry. Not one of those things. God did send the worm, and he sent the winds, not to punish Jonah, but to reveal Jonah. The worm did not make Jonah angry. Jonah was already angry. The heat and the wind didn't make him angry. He was already angry. Husbands, your wife is not the source of your anger problem. You're already angry. Uh-oh. Wives? I promise you he ain't the problem. He might be adding to the problem, but the root is in you. God always gave you to be the power, to be the, gave you the power to be the victor. The truth is God said something so profound when he said, you feel sorry for the plant and you did nothing to put it there, right? It came quickly, left quickly, but Nineveh has 120,000 people suffering in it. Don't you think I should feel sorry for that, Jonah? Why, who do we think we are complaining and yelling about situations we have no sweat equity in, right? Who do we think we are telling God what he should and should not care about when we haven't even tried to care about what he's caring about? Who do we think we are affording ourselves the luxury of being literally angry about inconvenience when people are suffering and we don't even try to be the answer, right? Listen, all the triggers do are reveal what's in your heart. That's it. Is it right for you to be angry about this? Ephesians 4, 26 says, in your anger, it doesn't say get rid of your anger. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. NLT says, don't, let, don't sin by letting anger control you. In Mark 11, uh, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in the, in the leaf, he went to find um, out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, may no one eat the fruit from you again. His disciples heard him say it. Hangry? Was he hangry? Like, I've always wondered about this. Why was Jesus just cursing a tree, right? But I, I did some research, what you should do when you don't understand something, right? Because right. um, you know what? Here's the deal. He can make a meal if he wanted one. He did it before, right? He didn't curse that tree out of being hungry. It's common for fig trees to bloom in phases, okay? So there's, there's a phase where the, the mature wood on a tree produces what is called the breba, B-R-E-B-A, figs, the breba figs. And they come from the established branches, the the mature wood on the tree, okay? So it was not time yet for the new figs to grow. This is just, this is how the tree works. The new branches had not come. That's why the Bible said it wasn't fig season yet. But before the fig season of the new green branches and the new figs grow, the breba figs do grow. And the reason we know this is true is because they leave leaves behind. There's leaves there. So sometimes... Now, this is just the coolest thing. Sometimes when you um, are growing the, the breba figs, the leaves will grow first and then the breba figs will follow. So at this point, there should have been established figs on the mature wood of that tree. Are you following me? So that's why Jesus walks up and, and it's like, there's gonna be breba figs on that tree. That's why those leaves are there. They should already be there. And he walks up and there's nothing. So Jesus is making a statement here. I don't like pretense. I like for you to have the appearance of maturity and that the fruit should be on there and it's not, right? This was mature wood. He wasn't cursing a green fig tree. These were breba figs where the maturity should be there. The, the, The wood was established. The leaves were there. The figs should have been on that tree. And Jesus is making a point. Prophet means nothing without the fruit. Teacher means nothing without the fruit. Theology means nothing without the fruit. Knowledge means nothing without the fruit. Without the fruit, the tree is pointless, right? Back to Jonah, a prophet, a messenger. A man with an agenda he carried closer than God's purpose. But Micah 7, 18 says, where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Our only job is to be angry at anything that stands in the way of people receiving God's mercy. We are never called to be angry at the people themselves. 
We're supposed to be the mature wood. If we're following Jesus, we're supposed to have the figs on our tree. We were certainly never called to rejoice in the demise of people who are living in sin, people who we deem evil people. We were never supposed to celebrate in the demise. Without the fruit of love, we're like the fig tree Jesus cursed, all leaves and no fruit. Or like Jonah, a prophet by title, we're like Christ followers by title, right? But with zero proof of who we really are. Can we do in this moment what the four chapters of Jonah, Jonah was never able really to do? Again, it's not about bashing Jonah. I love it that this book exists. And I know God's redemption. So I wish there was a part two to this. What happened in Jonah after he saw the transformation of Nineveh, right? We'll find out one day. But can we truly repent for our preconceived ideas about the Nineveh we've been called to? For our unspoken belief that there are indeed people beyond God's ability to love? For our arrogance and our disdain for flawed humans? Can we just pause and remember that we once were in Nineveh written off and forgotten, but someone somewhere somehow reached us and rewrote our family legacy through compassion and forgiveness. Can we stop and relive the fact that we were broken and we hurt others and we sat in the stank of our sin, just like the one we hate does? Can we stop and revel in the magnificently massive love God had on us that while we were hard-headed and obstinate, he sent us messengers like Sunday school teachers and grandmas and fishing buddies and neighbors to soften our calloused hearts? Can we truly put ourselves in a position not just to sit at the outskirts of Nineveh to watch and see, but to walk through the city gates with blankets and water bottles and cases of diapers and cups of coffee and make friends with people who vote differently and act differently and look differently than we do. I'm just gonna pray this. Cleanse our hearts, Lord. Correct our attitudes. Adjust our courses. Reveal our motives. Purge our judgments. Shatter our ideas. Break our molds. Shift our paths. Revamp our purpose. Refocus our attention. Refill our ability, release our love, frame our intentions, settle our emotions, quiet our offenses, heal our hurts, open our eyes, expand our hearts, embrace our inability, conquer our rebellion, position our spirits. For these are your people. You gave your life for them. And we commit our lives back to you for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We repent, Lord. I don't wanna ever sit outside the city gate when you're inside the city with them. I don't wanna ever take your kindness for granted. I don't ever want to um, act like your mercy is something trivial because you gave it to me too. So we just commit again. see people the way you see them and to love them the way you love them. You know what, if you're, if you're leaning on something that you see that the fruit's not on the tree, like this, uh, this, this, what I've been believing about God is not drawing people to me, it's pushing people away from me. All you have to do is change your mind. All you have to do is say, I've been doing this wrong. I'm gonna try doing it like Jesus did. If you're here and you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, we always pray this prayer, not out of formality, but because we think it's the most important decision, as Pastor Rod says, from the cradle to the grave, this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And through Facebook Live and live stream, if you're praying this with us, let's all do this together. Say, Jesus, I believe you came into this world. You lived a sinless life. You took my sin. You took my judgment. My past is gone. My future is spotless. I call you my Lord. Amen.